So I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Sean McDowell. Dr. McDowell has devoted his career to help bring truth to the next generation. As a college professor, high school teacher, and prolific author, he has exceptional insight into the prevailing culture and imparts his observations poignantly to fellow educators, pastors, parents, and students alike. Dr. McDowell is currently an associate professor of Christian apologetics at Biola University, the largest and top-ranked graduate program of its kind in the world. He has master's degrees in both theology and philosophy, and a PhD in apologetics and worldview studies. He is a highly sought-after speaker and has spoken at various camps, churches, universities worldwide, and is a frequent guest on radio and television shows. He is a best-selling author and has written or co-written over 20 books. He is a co-host for the Think Biblically podcast. Most importantly, he is a dedicated husband and father. He has been married to his high school sweetheart, Stephanie, since 2000. He lives in beautiful Southern California and has three children. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McDowell. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> it's great to be here with you in Texas. I live in Southern California, but was actually born here. Uh, now I know you, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of this place. It's not as big as College Station, not as significant. Maybe you've heard of it, Dallas. <laughs> there we go, we've got some love. Well, we've got a fascinating question before us tonight. The topic we've been asked to discuss is anything worth dying for? I think the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Whether it's for faith, or whether it's for friends, or for your country or a great cause, I'm gonna assume all of us agree that something is worth dying for. The question is not, is there something? The question is what and why? Now, I've got three former students when I was teaching high school that are here. Two are here at AM, one is at <clears throat> Baylor. I hope that's all right. <laughs> so they're going to laugh when I use this illustration, but bear with me. I'm thinking of the movies Infinity War and Endgame. I'm a big superhero fan. And I'm sure you've seen them, and you've had plenty of time, so I don't feel bad potentially ruining them to see them at this stage. But in Infinity War, if you notice, there's a core question at the heart of this movie. The movie starts off, and Thanos, the bad guy, has Thor captured, and Loki, his brother, has a decision to make. Will I allow Thanos to kill my brother, or give him the stone to save his life? Fast forward a little bit. Star-Lord and Gamora, two other characters in a relationship. Gamora says to Star-Lord, hey, if Thanos captures me, I want you to take my life so he can't take me and use me, which he eventually does to get the Soul Stone. Fast forward a little bit in the show. You've got Vision and Scarlet Witch. And Vision has one of the stones in his forehead, and they have to make a decision. Will we destroy the stone to prevent Thanos from getting the power, which will take and end the life of Vision. Fast forward again to one of the most epic scenes in my estimation in the MCU history is when Iron Man battles Thanos. And Doctor Strange has a decision to make, doesn't he? The decision is, am I going to give Thanos the time stone or allow him to take the life of Iron Man? Now, in contrast, what does Captain America famously say in that film? He says, we are not in the business of exchanging lives. Infinity War ends, as you know. Half the universe is gone because of the snap. But then we shift to Endgame. And what's very interesting in this movie is we discovered that there's one in 14 million possibilities, the only one that will stop Thanos, and get balanced back to the universe, so to speak, by bringing people back. And what is it? It's for Iron Man to willingly lay down his life as a sacrifice. 
Now, as a Christian, I'm watching this. I pause and I think, that's interesting. So here's Marvel for 10 years, arguably telling or trying to tell the most epic story they can tell, interweave stories, and they want this to be the most, the greatest climax you can have, the ultimate hero. And what does it point towards? It points towards Iron Man willingly laying down his life as a sacrifice. Now, I know none of you watched that and thought, Iron Man, don't do it. Nobody thought, you know, Iron Man, you be you. Live your truth. <laughs> hey, don't care about anybody else. This matters how you feel. Of course nobody thought that. Now, I'm sure there's some group on social media or some TikTok account dedicated to Iron Man making the wrong choice. But the rest of us know that he actually did the right thing. So if we step back, we think here's somebody willing to lay down their life, willing to die for others, we realize he made the right choice. If you enjoyed that movie, you're with me that we all know there's something to die for. Jesus said in John 15, 13, he said, greater love hath nothing than this, that someone laid down their life for a friend. That's the heart of the message of Jesus. You see, you and I know what we value by what we're willing to sacrifice for. What you sacrifice your time for, what you sacrifice your money for, and what you're willing to sacrifice your life for shows what you value. So I kind of pinch myself and think, here's Marvel trying to tell the greatest epic story. And it's climaxes with the hero laying down his life as an act of love for others. And you probably shed a tear in that moment. I was there opening night and people did because there's something moving about that. Now, of course, the Marvel stories and other films are fiction. But the Christian story in a sense, is the claim that this really happened in history, that this actually took place. I see that movie and I thought, wow, we know that's what love is, laying down your life. At the heart of the Christian story is that a God has created us for relationship. We've been separated from this God because of sin and the willing sacrifice of God who takes on human flesh enables us to be back in relationship with God. Now, if I'm right about this, it makes Christianity unique in a certain sense. It actually makes Christianity testable. You can actually examine it and see if it's true or see if it's false. So the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 of the letters in the New Testament, one of the greatest, if not the greatest missionary of all time, who really started taking the message out to the ends of the earth, so to speak, he wrote a letter to a church in Corinth called 1 Corinthians in the mid-50s. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he writes something very interesting. He says, specifically, he says, if Jesus is not risen, our faith is in vain. Do you notice how bizarre that is? I work with a professor at my university who got his, world, his PhD in world religions. And he says he's not aware of any other statement like this from any other world religion that says the entirety of the faith is rooted in a single testable historical event. So that means sometimes when we think about faiths, we'll think about, well, that might be true for you, but not true for me. That's your story. That's what gives you purpose. Christianity says your purpose and your meaning and all the benefits you get from it only matter if, in fact, Jesus has risen from the grave and died as a sacrifice. That's a pretty powerful thing. So you could disprove Christianity in a few ways. If you showed there was no soul, if you showed that Jesus didn't exist or Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then Christianity is false. Now, this brings me, in a sense, to my uh, dissertation topic and thesis that I'm going to launch into a little bit, and we're going to have some conversation about this, that I did on the deaths of the apostles. 
So let me lay this out, but just remind you where, what we've kind of covered so far. Number one, I think all of us are going to agree there's something worth dying for. Second, Christianity is rooted in the idea that God has actually come down through the person of Jesus and died for us, and these claims are testable. We can actually examine them. Now, my research, in a sense, on the apostles related to their martyrdom started on a trip about, God, think about this, 13 years ago. I was teaching high school at that time, full time, at a, at a Christian school, private school. And at this time, we were taking our students outside of their comfort zone to try to go engage people who saw the world differently. So I got together with a friend of mine. We're in Southern California. And I said, what's, you know, since these are Christians, what's the most secular, godless place we could take our students to, to engage people with a different worldview? So we took them to UT Austin. <laughs> You don't believe that, do you? <laughs> so where I'm at, where I live, you know the answer to that would be the city of Berkeley. Or my friend calls it Berserkly. <laughs> and part of it was, this is a private Christian school. And like tonight, having a conversation across worldviews, I would take my students to a very different place. And we brought in a Unitarian Universalist to speak one time. We brought in a number of atheists and agnostics brought in an LGBTQ advocate, an activist, and just tried to say, how do you have dialogue across these radical differences? And one of my friends who's an atheist was there, and he was arguing that Jesus didn't even exist. And one of my students said, raised his hand, he said, wait a minute, if Jesus didn't exist, then why did all the apostles die as martyrs for the belief in Jesus? And I'll never forget what my friend said. He goes, he leans in, he goes, Give me any evidence that any of them actually died as martyrs. And this is this moment as a teacher where all my students like turned and looked at me like I was supposed to have the answer. <laughs> and I remember thinking, you know what? I've heard that argument. I don't really know the answer to that, by the way. Because sometimes Christians will say the apostles claim to have seen the risen Jesus. And they were all willing to die to the point of not recanting their faith that this is true, therefore Christianity is true. And I'd heard that as a kid. But I started thinking, wait a minute, what is the evidence behind this claim? And so at that point, I needed a doctoral dissertation topic. And that night I was like, wait a minute, this is perfect. It's interesting. I can write on this, speak on this. I was hooked and started to research it. So here's just a few of the things that I came across in about three years of examining this, historically speaking. Number one is that the apostles very early on claimed to be eyewitnesses. They claimed to be witnesses of the things that they were proclaiming. So an apostle is somebody who sent. They were sent out to proclaim what they had seen. So 1 Corinthians 15, the passage I read before, but a few verses earlier, verses 3 through 5, Paul writes this. Again, this is about AD mid-50s. He says, I delivered to you the church at Corinth as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, an Aramaic name for Peter, and then to the 12. So here's Paul about two decades plus after the death of Jesus. And he says the key story is Jesus lived, died, buried, and then appeared to people, to the groups. Another passage is in Acts 2.32, written by Luke, a doctor. And he begins this account as it is gospel by saying, I carefully investigated all these things. Now in Acts chapter 2 is what's called Pentecost. So the apostles have replaced Judas, Jesus has ascended, and there's this explosion of the church and the beginning of the Christian movement. And it says in Acts 2.32, Peter's given a speech. It's the first kind of evangelistic message. He says, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So the earliest testimony we have of the Christian faith is that the first proclaimers of the faith were witnesses. But then the question is, they were witnesses of what? 
I probed a little further and I realized that the earliest account we have of the Christian story is that the apostles were witnesses of the risen Jesus. So to be a Christian was not to be on some campaign against poverty as important as it is to care about poverty. Jesus did and the apostles did. It was not just a campaign about loving your neighbor, although the idea of loving your neighbor comes from the teachings of Jesus. The idea was that Jesus had died and resurrected and offers forgiveness. That's the heart of the Christian message. So as I probed into the story, I realized that the claim is that they are witnesses and at root was their belief that Jesus had risen from the grave. But then I probed a little bit further and third I discovered that what they do starts to give me confidence that the apostles really believed that this was true. Now, what is it that gives me confidence amongst other things in their testimony? And it's that they willingly put themselves in harm's way to proclaim the risen Jesus. So if you just read the beginning of Acts, so to speak, in Acts 4 and 5, the apostles, the church starts and it's growing, and they go out publicly and start proclaiming this message that Jesus has risen from the grave. They're threatened, they're beaten, they're thrown in prison. In Acts 6, Stephen is martyred. Get to Acts 12, we have the death of James. And then through Paul and the apostles, they keep advancing this claim that Jesus had risen from the grave. So as I'm researching this, I thought, wait a minute, they claim to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And they're willing to suffer for that conviction. That gave me pause and I stepped back and I thought, what does that tell me about them and their beliefs? Now, what it doesn't prove is what they believe is true. I want to be very careful. But I think it shows they really believed it. They were sincere. You maybe heard it said, liars make poor martyrs. Why invent a story to intentionally put yourself in harm's way? That made me think at least minimally, they believe this. Now, right away, I know what you're thinking because I've been asked this question. I was in the middle of my research, I was staying at a bed and breakfast and there was a nun who was there. And I was having breakfast with a nun and she started grilling me on my research. And I was like, I did not expect this from a nun. <laughs> and uh, it was a great breakfast. I was like, wow, you're tough, good questions. And she said, well, look, there's a lot of martyrs in other beliefs and in other faiths. And of course, she's right. She's right. Now, some Christians have errantly said there's only martyrs within Christendom. That's just objectively false. There's plenty of people from different belief systems willing to suffer and die for what they believe in. I was watching the Vietnam a uh, special kind of multi-part series. And there's a pretty harrowing part where some Buddhist monks would light themselves on fire to protest the Vietnam War. Of course, there's kamikaze pilots who would crash and lose their lives. There's the terrorists on 9-11, who 15 of them crashed planes into buildings. They believed it. So all the willingness of the apostles to suffer and die shows that they really believed it. It doesn't make sense to say they're making this up. But there is one difference that's very interesting. Is that when somebody's willing to suffer and die for a cause, we've got to ask, what is that cause that they're willing to suffer for? So there's, there's many Jews who'd be willing to suffer. This is recorded in Maccabees for not violating the law. They would rather be put to death brutally than violate the law. But the heart of the Christian claim was not the law, not some great cause. It was that Jesus had risen from the grave and appeared to them. That's what they went out and proclaimed. 
Now, one difference, by the way, it's somewhat of a morbid example, but if somebody walks in here and says, Sean, I understand you've written a book on martyrdom. Do you really believe this? I say yes, and somebody takes my life, and I take one for the team, so to speak. That's a morbid way to put it, wasn't it? But if somebody takes my life, all you'd walk away and be like, wow, that guy, Sean, really believes it. That would prove nothing whatsoever about the truth of Christianity because I'm 2,000 years removed and it's been passed on from somebody else to me. But the apostles were there. They traveled with Jesus. They ministered with Jesus. And they were despondent when Jesus was crucified. But then something happened that turned them around where they become like lions of the faith, so to speak, willing to go out proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the grave, putting themselves in harm's way, and now more people call themselves followers of Jesus than anyone who's ever lived. That cries out for explanation. So bottom line, because of their conviction that Jesus had risen from the grave, the apostles willingly put themselves in harm's way. To me, it just shows the depth of their conviction that this was true. And it's one piece of a larger case that we could unpack and discuss for the truth of Christianity. This doesn't prove it itself. It's just one piece. So let me sum it up and then let's, let's have a conversation about this. Number one, I think when we're asked to discuss the topic is anything we're dying for, after about 30 seconds of reflection, I thought, of course, we all know there's something we're dying for. Minimally dying for a friend. We see it in literature and film across the world. The Christian story is that this is what God did. He willingly laid down his life for us, which makes Christianity testable. One way we can put it to the test is taking a look at the first witnesses, the people who traveled with Jesus, and begin to ask, can we trust their testimony and their willingness to suffer? And I think we could get into this. I don't think we can prove they all died as martyrs, but I think we know at least four of them, maybe six did, but they're willing to put themselves in harm's way minimally to me shows they're not making this up. They're not liars. They really believe that this was true. With that said, you ready to have a conversation? Yes. Let's do this. Greg, you're going to do an introduction, and then we're going to move the conversation, and I look forward to some of the questions. So now, I am happy to announce our second speaker for the evening, Texas A&M's very own Dr. Matthew Vess. Dr. Vess grew up near Whipple, Ohio, a small town in Appalachia. He first attended Tiffin University because he wanted to be a criminal, profiler, criminal profiler for the FBI. However, after learning that the job of criminal profiler was imaginary, <laughs> he left Tiffin University and eventually earned a BA in psychology from Ohio University. Fortuitous scheduling at Ohio University led him to take existential philosophy and social psychology courses during the same academic term which introduced him to the possibility of utilizing psychological science methods to explore questions about existential concerns. Dr. Vest earned a PhD in social psychology from the University of Missouri, and his research examines the basic psychological processes that underlie people's efforts to manage existential concerns about identity, authenticity, meaning, and personal mortality. His work is regularly published in top-tier psychological journals and has been featured in media outlets such as Vice and Slate. Dr. Vest is currently an associate professor and the associate head for graduate studies in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Texas A&M University. So at this point, when he comes up, we'll be transitioning to a time of dialogue with Dr. McDowell and Dr. Vest on this question of what people are willing to die for. So join me in welcoming Dr. Vess. When I got invited to be part of this, um, I kind of thought, am I being asked to be a martyr for scientific worldviews? 
because I don't, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and I, I actually think that says something about belief um, that, that maybe we can talk about in a second. Um, but I did want to just kind of give a scope of what I do and maybe why I'm sitting up here. Um, and so I am a social psychologist who, for better or worse, studies the psychological function of belief. I'm interested in sort of what functions do beliefs play in people's lives? What problems do they help them solve? And we all can think about the various things we believe, right? I believe that Michael Jordan is a far better basketball player than LeBron James. Maybe far, <laughs> maybe not. I also believe that my wife is one of the best people in the entire world. One of those beliefs is more important for my life than, <laughs> than the other, right? And so we sort of all have beliefs that vary in terms of importance. And what my work largely tries to do is to figure out in what ways are the important beliefs that people invest in useful to them. And much of my work operates from a defensive kind of orientation where we sort of argue that Human beings are in a precarious spot because we're really smart. And we can think about things that other species may not be able to think about. We can project ourselves across time. We can think about who we were in the past. We can also imagine who we're going to be in the future. And one of the things that we can imagine in the future is that we're going to die at some point, right? And not only can we imagine that, we know that it is inevitable. That is a problem for a species that's biologically oriented to try to survive. So how do we deal with those, th that, that problem? And what, I mean, I'm, I'm not the person who came up with this. People from all sorts of different disciplines, including philosophy, anthropology, sociology, psychology, have kind of landed on this idea that the way our species kind of solved that problem was that we developed elaborate belief systems that give our lives meaning, and they sort of offer explanations for sort of where we come from, why we're here, what we're supposed to do when we're here, and what happens to us after we're gone. And oftentimes, that sort of what happens to us after we're gone is a viable pathway to some semblance of immortality. Right? And you can think about sort of secular beliefs providing a pathway to immortality, right? You can think, I, does this auditorium have a name? It probably does. Certainly we're in Rudder Tower, right? And so whoever Rudder was, I'm sorry if Rudder is here, I don't know Rudder. <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter if Rudder's here, that's awesome. But right, this is sort of a permanent stake you've contributed to culture in a way that is more lasting than your personal self. Now that's not the only kind of immortalities that beliefs can provide. Some beliefs provide a literal form of immortality, right? This is not the end of your existence, it's the end of your physical existence and a soul lives on and goes to some other realm, whatever the belief is, right? And so from a psychological standpoint, the argument is that people have a need to feel that their beliefs are valid because those beliefs carry important implications for what happens to them after they die. Now, <clears throat> I study beliefs, and what I'll tell you is, functionally, it doesn't, believe, but it doesn't matter if the belief is true <laughs> or untrue. They often function very similar ways, and I'll give you some examples. So in my laboratory, what we do is we bring people in, and we expose them to a threat. Like, we try and threaten them. Sometimes we tell them that they're really bad as students to try and lower their self-esteem to see how they respond. We debrief them afterwards. Some of you may have been in one of these studies, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> we also ask people to think about their own mortality. We ask them to think about physically dying. And then we see sort of what beliefs will they defend. And so one of the things we see over and over again is that people will defend the beliefs that they identify as giving their life meaning. So people who are religious, when you remind them of mortality, report that they have a stronger belief in God. People who uh, sort of, well, we actually have data too that people uh, who report being religious, both Muslim and Christians, 
When they're reminded of their mortality, they express a greater willingness to die for those beliefs or sacrifice something for, right? So it can be like, would you sacrifice all of your life's earnings to improve the church, for example? Both of those beliefs are very different, right? A Muslim ideology, Christian ideology, different, but functionally very similar. And what's really interesting is when we start talking about atheists, because atheists will report believing less in God if you remind them of mortality, and that's a part of their worldview. But I have a colleague who will argue that they're actually religious when they're threatened. And this is where I think it starts to get somewhere interesting. So they will report that they believe in God less, but they become much more willing to say that miracles can happen. And so for me, like kind of what that starts to articulate, and then I'll shut up and we can have a dialogue here, is <laughs> there's tension between kind of a scientific worldview and a religious worldview. And I think at times that tension is created because we think they have to be at odds. I personally don't see them as being at odds. I see them as being distinct from one another, right? We have beliefs that we can verify. 100% without doubt, verify. Like, I'm, I could throw this pen, and like, if I threw it hard enough, it would hit someone, right? Like, everyone agree that that's what would happen? Even without seeing me throw? OK. How many of you, and maybe this is something we can talk about, would be willing to die for that kind of belief? I was thinking as Sean was talking, I was like, that's really interesting, you know? Like, but Iron Man didn't really know that 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 sacrifice was going to lead to victory. He had faith that it did, probably, right? And so the beliefs that we might be willing to die for may not always be the ones that are verifiable through science. And I think this is why even atheists will start to say, like, yeah, I believe in miracles. Because when we're threatened existentially, we need a belief that functions existentially. And I'm not always sure that science does. And so I'm wondering maybe in your scholarship, if you've ever kind of thought about a purely scientific belief versus a sort of belief that is grounded in faith that's not verifiable. Mm. And if those two things are equivalent in ways of thinking about, would you die for them or martyrdom? I'm tempted to push back on the Iron Man point, but I think that would oh, good. distract us. Yeah, yeah. We'll, go, we'll go there later. Yeah. Um, so. For me, it, and I, this would be me speaking as a Christian, sure. faith is not believing something without evidence. Consistently as it's laid through scripture, faith is trusting God in light of what we have a reason to believe is true. Now, not certainty, but a kind of confidence. So why, why did Jesus do miracles? He did miracles to show people with confidence as a sign that he had authority he was speaking as the son of God. Why did Moses split the Red Sea? It says over and over again in Exodus 7 through 14, so you will know, so you will know, so you will know. So I agree with you that there's no conflict between science and between what we've called faith. But I do think there's an element of faith, again, not certainty in a different way that can be tested and can be examined with a range of different mechanisms, whether it's philosophy, potentially psychology, science, so I think we agree that they don't conflict, but maybe because we have a different understanding of the nature of faith and the nature of science. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could say more about that. So I'm, I'm interested in this idea of, like when I think of something as being testable and I have my empiricist hat on, I'm thinking about something that you can reproduce and predict, like, great, so if I have these conditions in place, I can predict that this will happen and this will occur, and I have evidence that I can readily observe to verify the process that led to that outcome. Yep. I have a harder time seeing that in sort of many sort of what I would consider to be faith, right? Like, I sort of, I don't know that you need faith to believe that. You can agree or disagree, but I'm not sure it requires faith. Whereas other beliefs, I think, do require faith. Um, does that make sense, what I'm saying? It does, yeah. So I would respond a couple ways. I would say I do think science requires a kind of faith, philosophically speaking, in the sense that faith that our brains match up with reality, faith that reality is rational, rational that things are repeatable, 
there's a certain element of faith that's built into that, at least based on a certain worldview. Um, what was the second part of what you said? Sort of the question of whether or not... Mm -hmm. We were really rolling. Yeah, we were. So, um, <laughs> well, I think... Oh, oh, I got it. I got it. it took me a second. <laughs> um, whether it's testable was the point. So I don't think faith is testable in the way you're describing. It's not scientifically testable. Right. Mm -hmm. If you mean by scientific, we mean repeating something, given a hypothesis, testing it empirically. Now, of course, a lot of sciences are broader than that. We use like abductive reasoning. where they have hypotheses, look at the test for it, and examine it a different way, broadly speaking. So faith is not testable in the scientific fashion. But I think it's testable historically speaking. I think it's testable philosophically speaking because it makes claims about reality in the objective world in which we live that we can see. Again, no differently, but I just wouldn't limit testability to the realm of science. I think we can test things philosophically, like the soul, potentially. Uh, things like uh, historical claims we can test. Somebody says, yeah, Texas A&M founded 1850. Well, I don't know what year it was founded. I'm obviously making that up. I'm, I'm assuming all of you know, and I just offended you. Do you know how many times I've been told that Texas A&M is the largest university in America? <laughs> You're proud. I get it. That's awesome. <laughs> we could test that, but in a different way than we test science. So at least Christianity, that's all I can speak for, the facts matter and faith is built upon what we should test. But even in that example, right, so the testing like the, when Texas A&M was founded or if it's the largest university, I think it depends on how you rig the numbers probably a little bit. <laughs> Right, there, there's observations and data that you can readily point to to verify that's true or not true. Yep. And I guess for me, as someone who is not a Christian, sure. it's harder for me to see the equivalence of that, even if you want to say that's not testing it scientifically. Again, I don't have to have faith like when the fact is in front of me. It, it seems like testing the factual accounts of something that at some point just requires faith. I mean, can, can you get to Christian faith without taking a leap of faith? Does that make sense? So that's going to depend on how we define a leap of faith. Of course, Kierkegaard famously talked about that, and he had a fideistic view that was apart from the facts. So can you get that way? Sure. Sure. But I don't think that's what the scriptures teach. I don't think that's what Jesus invited people to love God with your heart, your soul, and your mind. Right. So in a sense, broadly, we could, we could test, and this, given that you're in psychology, this is a whole other conversation. Does it make sense of our experience that we have a soul or not? Or can things be reduced just down to matter in motion? I think we could examine that claim in a certain sense and see which makes best sense of our experience in the world. We could test, is there evidence for design and a maker in the universe. Maybe that's DNA. Maybe that's a fine-tuning of the universe. Are there certain indications within the world that point towards an intelligence? We could test that. Not throw in a pen, but test it. And distinctly, I mean, Christianity is rooted dis essentially on the claim that Jesus lived, died, buried, rose on the third day. So there's a way we can test and see, are there other hypotheses that better explain this? Is it knowable? So there certainly is an element of trust, right? I'm not saying it's reduced yeah. down to just certain things that we know, but it's not just trusting blindly without reason to believe so. That's where I would differ, even though it's tested, again, differently than scientific claims. Yeah, and I think that the reason part of that is useful to think about. Um, I think we're using the word test slightly different. When I think of an empirical yeah. test, it means something slightly different than just sort of Agreed. reasoning through the, the sort of uh, rationality of the argument, for example. Right? That's Fair enough. not quite science, uh, at least the way I orient 
toward it, towards it, and it kind of reminds me of, I, I was part of this group that had a lot of philosophers in it, and if you've never spent a lot of time with philosophers, they're wonderful people. Uh, but if you are sci like inclined to a scientific worldview, after about six hours, it becomes a little bit tiring. Uh, I'm a philosopher. Six hours with a philosopher. <laughs> I'm impressed it's, you lasted that long. I always tell people, it's like, uh, if you want to know the question you think you're asking, but you're not asking, talk to a philosopher almost immediately, and then, and then you'll get there. But we were talking about free will. Mm. Right? And so free will to me is something that gets discussed a lot in scientific circles. Largely because I'm a psychologist and to people there's a lot of research showing that uh, behavior is governed largely by non-conscious processes and so conscious will and agency doesn't matter all that much. Turns out that's not entirely true. Right. And there were folks who were interested in genetics and sort of how do genes operate and if if we know, for example, that genes lead to certain kinds of behaviors, where is free will in this debate? And this incredibly, incredibly intelligent, smart, sharp, wonderful human being as a psychiatrist stood up in the room and was like, you know, I'm wondering, like, to me, free will is, we haven't figured out how to measure it yet and how to test it and demonstrate it empirically. And I think that's because it's not objective. It's subjective. We have the experience of free will, and so therefore we believe that it's true. And he sort of used that as an argument of like, well, our, our beliefs about the world sort of color the way we see it. And I'm wondering a little bit about, so when I think about a scientific method and sort of the rigor of a belief, we're oftentimes utilizing a method that's designed to remove as much as possible objective, or, or I'm sorry, subjective biases, right? Uh, if you know what you want the study to show, how do you design a study that doesn't let that color the way you design it and so mm -hmm. forth? And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about sort of the ways you might go about doing that in this kind of belief, right? So sort of how do you remove your own subjectivity to evaluate it objectively? And I'm not yeah. sort of saying that you're not, no, no, but no, I'm no. really interested in this as like a process. That is a Super fascinating question. And by the way, I think you're right about free will. That if we're trying to test free will empirically, we might be using the wrong tools to detect something. Or they don't exist, right? Like yeah, this, this. yeah. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll leave free will in this. I'm so tempted to, to go there. But, but part of the question, the testing would be, is that experience of making choices uh, a part of what it means to be human? So if we lose free will, things like moral blame and moral praise and things like love and even sacrificing, like in the case of Iron Man, was that a, the reason we love it, I know you always bring it back to Iron Man, <laughs> is, is this sense that he chose to do that. So because it's so deep in our experience, whatever our worldview does, can it account for that experience? That's one way of testing, but very different, you're right, right, than empirical testing. So in a grad class I teach in the resurrection, I use about an 800-page book called The Resurrection of Jesus by a friend of mine, Mike Lacona. And he's got page after page. And the reason I mention him is he is the most careful scholar I know of that has gone to pains to try to minimize bias. And he lists out six things. I don't think I'll remember all six. Uh, but one would be, it says, make public exactly what your beliefs are. So part of that introduction, I mean, it was assumed this is Veritas, wanted people to know, hey, I'm a Christian, <laughs> putting my you know, beliefs out there so people understand where I'm coming from. State your beliefs. So he's like, I'm from this race, from this age. Here's where I grew up. Here's my biases. List them all as you can. That's one. Uh, a second thing would be is have a very careful, rigorous historical methodology. So for me, when it came to the apostles, I laid out like a 10-point grid from least probable, mid-range to most probable, and then included sources within a certain time frame, certain quality of sources, and use that rubric, so to speak, and then plug into it. So some scholars don't. They'll just jump in and they'll start talking about their subject, but I laid out, here is my rubric. 
uh, that's one. A third thing was, is a kind of peer review, which obviously we do in academics. And so even in the dissertation that I did, we've been talking about it a little bit, it's almost 10 years since it's been out, and I've gotten a ton of feedback on that and adjusted my views on a few things. So it does look different. It's not a hard science when it comes to things within history, and I can't speak really to other disciplines, but I think if we lay our biases out there, I think if we come up with certain methodology and state it, I think if we invite certain critical feedback, put our ideas to the test, I think that's the best we can do to minimize our biases. Are they ever fully gone? Of course not. Yeah. But I think it helps to minimize them to give us more confidence in, in, in the truth. Yeah. Does that make sense? What do you it, think about that? It, I love it and, and sort of I, I like the way that, you know, I hadn't thought about it like this before, but the sort of giving confidence in truth, right? And, and I think that to me is sort of where my work is really kind of rooted is in people's uh, sort of confidence in the validity or truth of their beliefs. And, and I think what you just laid out from my you know, naive perspective is a useful way to go about gaining certainty in one's beliefs because I can tell you like my work also documents a number of other ways that people can acquire validity in their own beliefs and one of the ways they do that is by basically denigrating beliefs that are different than their own, right? Yeah, no, it, I agree. Um, and so I think what you kind of laid out is a really sort of the antithesis to that and I think you know, that it's virtue, right? Like sort of reasoning out and sort of reflecting on the nature of your own beliefs. Um, can yeah. I, can I ask you a question if yeah. I'm not cutting in? Yeah, no, please do. So one of the things you said early on, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, was that human beings are smart. We have this awareness of our finitude that we're going to die. So it creates this tension and this need to invent, I don't know if you use that word or not, but construct or concoct systems to cope with death, our own mortality. Was that close enough? Yeah, I mean, the argument is like culture was a byproduct of our need to solve this like sort of metaphysical existential question. I'm not 100, like, okay. so for me, like, that's where we move away a little bit from what's like, supported by empirical data and sort of what is theoretical, right? Okay. That's, that's partly what I was going to ask, because the data shows, obviously, we're intelligent, we fear death, and then we're drawn towards these systems that help us cope with our own mortality. And you're right, the, what, what are called, and I've seen you use this term, symbolic immortality projects. Mm -hmm. We fear death, so whether it's our name in the building, something great that we do will outlive us, helps us cope with death. Now. I look at that data as a Christian, and I think what you said is one way to make sense of that data, that we come up with these explanations to face our death, our fear of death. Another way could be if there is a God and he made us to be in relationship with him, made us smart, made us aware of our own finitude. So as it says in Ecclesiastes, eternity is written on our hearts. So we would seek after truth and be motivated to do so. Now, obviously, I interpreted that data differently given my belief yeah. system. But is that consistent with the data in itself or not? Like, do both of those explanations account for the way you see this? Uh, could you? So I guess one question I would have is then how would that account account for uh, variability in cultural belief systems, right? So if, maybe I misinterpreted, but it seems like that's sort of one explanation, like this is the explanation for why we're aware of our own finitude and this is why we you know, engage in these behaviors or whatever. How does that account explain for the variability in religion, political, national? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think in principle it has to account for the range of different beliefs. It just has to account that humans are truth-seeking, belief-seeking beings. And so it makes sense of the fact that across the different kind of cultures, we would be seeking things to outlive ourselves. And so we might expect to see there to be 
a range of things people would lean towards. Yes, I agree with that. I think maybe where I would not be as confident would be the origin of that intelligence and awareness. For what, what you said, like, God gave us the awareness. Another explanation would be evolution, just oh, it's yeah. a byproduct of evolution. Yeah. I, I got it. So that, that's, that's interesting. I guess at this point, I'm pointing towards this data that I know you've done in your research, mm -hmm. and we're bringing different worldviews to it. Two ways to make sense of that data. Now, one way to settle it would be to say, all right, let's see if there's evidence for intelligent design or evolution. Different topic that we're going to Yeah, I think, I, I think large part what how you're seeing that data, again, from if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, I think my data is actually silent in that regard. Like my data is not, it does not inform at all sort of why, like the, the sort of root foundation of the truth of the belief. Mm. It doesn't argue that this belief is better than this belief. It simply says that there's a common psychological function to beliefs. And so for people who invest in a particular worldview, they'll defend that worldview. And it seems to be the case that that generalizes for both religious people, for non-religious people, for folks in Australia, for folks in Japan. And so, but again, I, I think, and this is one of the things I try to impress on my students when I talk about this stuff, um, because not surprisingly, students have questions like, you know, are you saying the only reason that I'm religious is because I f have a fear of death? And I said, no, I, I, that's not. You have your own personal reasons for being religious. What my data suggests is that there's actually a very important psychological function that that faith is playing. And I think for me, and thinking about, and I, I've been studying this stuff for a decade, and Ernest Becker is the, the cultural anthropologist who sort of developed these kinds of ways of thinking, and even Becker, I think, would argue that religious belief in many ways is the most useful <laughs> belief to have because it solves the problem of death in a very direct and literal way. Uh, you don't have to rely on having Rudder Tower named after you. <laughs> um, and so I guess like for me in thinking about like what does my work say about religion, I don't know that my work says that much about religion other than to say like my own read on looking at data in a number of different places is that religious belief is qualitatively different than forms of belief that are grounded just in like observable data. And I think the needs that that kind of belief fulfill may actually be more functional, psychologically speaking. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. I think. Uh, I guess I'd invite you to disagree with that, but I'm guessing you would agree. Um, yeah, I th so your point is really interesting that functionally different beliefs Islam, Christianity could help you cope with death functionally the same. To the extent that people yeah. believe in them. Yes. Exactly. Yes. I, I totally agree with that. I have no, I have no qualm with that. That, that makes sense to me. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't challenge that. I guess I, I'm trying to think, and maybe it's just the way I think as a philosopher, nuancing certain things, is if, if, if so if you take an evolutionary worldview, understood in a sense where there's not a god some kind of creation where there is a god. Which of these data systems, are they surprising? Do they fit? Is this what we would expect given that belief system is the interesting question to me. So when I look at this, when I'm reading your stuff, I'm going, yeah, it makes sense. We're smart. We fear death. We want some symbolic immortality. That's what it means to be human because eternity is written on our hearts. That makes perfect sense. It fits within and didn't seem to challenge anything unless I misunderstood it. I see, I it. see what you're saying. And I was believing, I'm like, oh, from a psychological standpoint, that makes sense. I would ask the question from an evolutionary standpoint, how does this make sense? Is it that it appears and then we go, well, we've got to come up with a story now to account for this or is this what we would expect to find in the data from an evolutionary standpoint? Does that make sense? 
It does make sense. And there are, you know, I, the evolutionary perspectives on belief are varied. Um, I only know when it sort of butts up to the theory that I primarily operate from. Um, actually, the, interestingly enough, the thing that we've received the most kind of argument over is the idea that there's a, like, that there is a natural fear of death. Like they, they sort of see that as an instinct and in evolutionary circles, the idea of instinct okay. is problematic. Um, and so what we would argue is what the theory sort of says is like it's not an instinct to fear death, but we're an organism that wants to stay alive and we know that we're gonna die and that seems psychologically problematic. I'm not sure that an evolutionary sort of worldview at least evolutionary theory would, I mean, they talk about religion as like a meme at times. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. Okay. And I'm not sure they're, the evolutionary theory as a whole would make predictions that we make at all the times, but then I think these are conceptual arguments, and this is part of a scientific worldview, is like those are conceptual arguments that probably need a bit more data to see. It's just evolutionary theory in general is kind of difficult to test directly, um, at least in the type of things that I do. Um, and then most of it is kind of post hoc for me. Fair enough. I think we're supposed yeah. to shift about to questions. Yeah, it was 8.03. Right we did good. Um, well, I enjoyed that very on, much. So did yeah, I. I yeah, good, it. good questions. Thank you. Good interaction. Um, All right. Well, thank you very much for that engaging dialogue. So we've now reached the time of the evening where we are ready for some Q&A from the audience. And as some of you have already done, you can submit your question to the website or QR code up there on the screen on your smartphone. And again, you are able to upvote questions that you agree with, even if you don't submit a question. So with that, we are going to dive into the Q&A period. OK, so we're ready to start going. So. Wait, you forgot the opening. How hard is it? Yeah. It's your one chance. It's your chance. Oh, yes. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> okay, so here's a question. I think we can agree that laying down your life for a good cause is considered noble. But what about taking the life of another in defense of life or country? So to paraphrase, is there anything worth killing for? So, I assume that's for me. <laughs> Regardless of how I answer this, doesn't call into question that it's willing the points that I made earlier. Does that make sense? So whether I say it's worth killing or not, doesn't change that we recognize it's worth sacrificing your own life. So I would say, yeah. I mean, I'll be dead honest with you. If somebody came after my wife and my kids, and the only way I could stop them is by taking their life, I would take their life. Hands down. I would. Now, I would try to do everything to stop them first. Look, I'm in California. I don't have a gun, just for the record. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, it's not going to happen anyways. But I, I, I'm one who holds that there could be, in some cases, war. That doesn't mean every war can be justified. Um, certainly things in World War II. Self-defense, yeah. And I actually would argue that could be the loving thing to do in certain circumstances. But especially as a Christian, I would try to do everything first to not take the life, to find another way, and that would be a last resort. If I had to defend my family, you better believe I would. You want to weigh in? You don't have to. Well, no, I kind of do, but I kind of don't. I agree. I agree with that, though. I'm not sure I would characterize self-defense as a belief. Like, I think, like, protecting my life, I feel like that's more base than like kind of an abstract belief. So I'm like, yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not, I, I'm not sure I would think about 
if someone was coming at me with a gun, like, I'm not sure I would say I'm acting on a belief. I would say I'm just acting to save my life. And the only reason I say this is, be, again, in my data, we actually show that uh, when people are consciously thinking about death, they don't defend their belief systems. They just take it steps to like protect their health. Mm. And that doesn't seem to be moderated or driven by belief at all. Um, and so that's the only reason I would say that. But people could do military training. That, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why I was like, I kind of want to do this, but I kind of don't, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Okay, uh, this question is for Dr. McDowell. Could you summarize what type of evidence we have regarding the fates of the apostles? Are there eyewitness accounts? Is it church legend? Uh, I'll be as quick as I can. So I studied the 12 apostles of Jesus, and then James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul. So take Peter, for example. There's two first century sources, John 21 and a letter called Clement of Rome in the mid-90s that point to the martyrdom of Peter. There's about eight other sources through the second century that unanimously, to varying degrees of strength, support that Peter died as a martyr. No evidence to the contrary. Vast majority of scholars accept that. So I put that in the highest level. Paul, very similar. There's more like eight sources rather than 10, one first century source rather than two, but it's early, it's consistent um, from church fathers. Uh, some are from scripture. I think that's in solid ground. James, the brother of Zebedee, is recorded in Acts 12 too. And two reasons give me confidence in this. Number one, I think the book of Acts is very historically reliable. I think there's a lot of cities and people and places that Luke got right. But also in that account in Acts 12 too, it describes the death of uh, James in a way that Craig Keener in his commentary on Acts says it just reports like an execution account does in that culture at that time. So we have that account that's early for James that I would argue is reliable. And then James, the brother of Jesus, we actually have Josephus, a Jewish source, at the end of the first century. We have Gnostic sources and Christian sources into the second century. Those, I think, we have high level of probability for them. There's two other apostles, Andrew and Thomas. Now we're moving into the second and the third century, less sources. So I still think you can make a case historically that it's more probable than not but not as firm as you can Peter, Paul, and both James. The other apostles, I don't think we know where history ends and where legend begins. I don't think, I couldn't find a way historically to test that, so to speak. That's a quick answer. <laughs> this question's for both of you. Um, what are some examples of martyrs today? Are there any non-religious examples, like political martyrs? You stumped both of us. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you have a... Uh... Well, hey, you know, I mean, I think there's probably ways to think about terrorists, like suicide bombers, as both serving political and religious needs, but that's all I can think of. I appreciate that you use the word terrorist, because it's very different when you are attacked and lay down your life versus lose your life attacked attacking others and taking their lives. I think, to me, that's a, a, a distinction. Yeah. I'll give you an example. There was a, I don't remember, two or three years ago, maybe it's before COVID, so it all blends together. Um, there was a French priest, I believe, and a man came in and, to be honest, I can't remember if it was in France or in England, slit his throat at the altar. And the language talked about him being a martyr. And it was a radical Muslim who did this. And, that, and I think based on the definition of martyr, I think it broadly would qualify as so. Um, so there probably are, but that's not really my focus and specialty. I was studying the first couple centuries of the church when it comes to martyrdom. Yeah. So I don't really want to say much more. OK. Um, also, the next question is for both of you. What <laughs> evidential value is there in near-death experiences? I 
I'm happy to answer. Do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's clear that people report having them. And I know there was a study a while ago that, that they do. They, they put art, if you guys know this, they put art facing the ceiling in hospitals. You guys know this? And waited for people to flatline. And then if they were able to be resuscitated, asked them what, was, what the art was. I see some heads shaking. Do we know the results of that study? <laughs> I feel like we would know it if, if it actually was verified or at least confirmed something. Uh, again, I think this is one of those, it's the kind of thing for me personally that I think, yeah, you can start to get, you can study near-death experiences qualitatively. You can ask people to report on them. But there's a subjectivity to the data that you collect and the methods that we currently have available can neither confirm nor disconfirm them. And so for me personally, I think at least my approach would be we're silent as to whether or not it's true, but people have them. I mean, report having them for sure. I think near death experiences are one good piece of evidence that life continues after the present and that you are more than matter and have a soul. Not definitive certainty, but a positive evidence in this regard. So it was 2017 or 2018, the University of Missouri had an entire press by academics and medical doctors walking through the evidence for near-death experiences. This is not just religious folks studying this. There are professional journals of people looking at cases. Now, if somebody I met a guy, I was actually in studying, writing a lecture on near-death experiences at a local Starbucks near where I live. And a pastor came and he sat down, didn't know what I was doing. He looked at me and said, do you mind if I share my near-death experience with you? <laughs> <laughs> and I usually see him at a different Starbucks across town. I said, sure. He shared this whole experience, but there was no way to confirm it. It was entirely his story. What's interesting about near-death experiences are when people are medically flatlined, come back and report information they could not have known or not have had in that state. And there are many, many, many cases of this that are very carefully documented. So I can think of one, for example, and I'm probably going to butcher the details, but it was, it was a lady who had a cardiac arrest taken to the hospital and goes in, has a medically dead for whatever period of time it was, comes back and says, I had an out-of-body experience, and I saw a size 10 blue left uh, sneaker with a smudge over the uh, toe on, I think it was the fourth story outside the hospital. They go out there and they find exactly what she described. Now, either she placed it there and induced a cardiac arrest and rushed herself. <laughs> I mean, or her account actually seems to describe something she couldn't have known from that location. There are multiple accounts like this documented. There's a book called Near Death Experiences by a friend of mine, Dr. J. Steve Miller. And from all academic sources, gives over and over these kind of examples. Now, this certainly doesn't prove Christianity is true, doesn't prove the soul is immortal. But it suggests when the body stops functioning, there's something more to you than just the body, given the kind of information that could not have been known. Next, uh, this is for Dr. Vess. If our minds have been shaped by evolutionary forces for survival, how far can we trust them to guide us to truth? Hmm. Did I say that? <laughs> I'm be very careful about what I'm saying here. Hmm. How far can you trust your mind? Well, I think probably the way that I can answer this is at least staying in my lane a little bit because I'm not an evolutionary theorist. I would say that we know that we possess many biases and that those biases serve psychological functions. I used to do this. Maybe we'll try it right now. Can everyone close your eyes real quick? Relative to 
the average person, your same age here in College Station, how honest are you? And if you're above, like five is the midpoint, so if you're five or higher, raise your hand. Now everyone look around. <laughs> now, this is not a statistics lesson, I promise. That's awesome. But we all can't be above average. <laughs> But yet we know, like, people report being slightly better than average on positive characteristics. That's true. It is A&M. Oh. That's true. That's true. But I did say relative to your peers here in College Station. So, yeah. Right? And so that's just one example of a bias that our brains sort of possess. And there are people who say that that's a motivated bias. I tend to, to agree with that. But it's also a cognitive bias, right? We, we don't always know what we don't know, and that produces problems. What I would say is living our lives, some of those biases are good. Do you know, do you know what the better than average effect tends to be associated with? <laughs> self-esteem. <laughs> and self-esteem is a pretty good thing. And so I would say, like, being aware of your biases is good. Thinking that like we have to have absolute truth for everything is probably not even, I don't know, possible. But recognizing your biases and recognizing your limitations is probably useful to at least consider every once in a while, right? Like if someone asks you, my favorite better than average effect, and I know I'm kind of rambling, but I gotta say this, prisoners think that they're more moral than the average person mm. <laughs> on average. Right. So maybe that's a misguided thing. So I think, from my perspective, I think our minds have sort of evolved to solve problems for our species, and one of those is value, and how do we feel valuable, and we have biases that help us do that. I don't know that we always want to be truth seekers, per se, mm. but that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in on this one? <clears throat> Absolutely. So Darwin himself wrote, he said, the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind, which has evolved from the lower monkeys or animals, is at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the conviction in a monkey's mind? In other words, Darwin started to realize that if he had a purely materialistic evolutionary process that results in the brain, it undermined any confidence he could have in the conclusions that the brain resulted and gave us. So you can, Alvin Plantinga laid this out. He wrote a book called Where the Conflict Really Lies. And so he said, like we talked about earlier, he said that he doesn't believe there's any conflict between science and faith. The conflict between science and faith is on the surface, but at the core, he argues that there's a conflict between materialism and science, not faith and science. Why? This is Plantinga's argument. Because if we evolved without plan or purpose or reason to survive, you can survive on false beliefs. So he gives an example to make the point. He says, if you desire to see a tiger and hug him, but the best way is to run away, you're actually going to survive, even though that's a false belief. So I, I think the question is very perceptive. I was having a different dialogue with, with, with a fellow, and he said, look, science has actually shown we can't trust the brain. And I said, OK, wait a minute. It seems to me to do a scientific research that says we can't trust the brain, you've got to assume that you can actually trust it, right? But that's the question that's at play uh, if our brains evolve through a purposeless material process. So I think that's where a deeper conflict actually lies. Um, I, can I ask you a question? I'm totally curious. The question was, because um, I know you study psychology, about the mind. Do you believe there's an immaterial mind, or do you believe it's just the brain? I would say what I believe is irrelevant um, <laughs> what I, <laughs> for most things. I mean, that, that, I'm like, not trying to trap you. No, no. I mean, uh, honestly, for most questions like that, that's typically my response is like what I believe is kind of irrelevant. But um, I 
think, I mean, I study the self, and the self is one of those things. It's like, where's the self at? Where is it? Is it here? Is it here? It's probably, it's got to be in the brain, right? So I, I guess my sort of, if I can be a, I don't know, fence sitter here, I think the brain creates experiences that transcend sort of their emergent properties, I guess is what I would say. It is a complex, interrelated series of networks that any understanding each of the networks in and of themselves does not fully explain the experience of selfhood that we have. Okay. Does that make sense? Fair enough. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I jumped Great. in. No, it's good. Um, I think we're going to take maybe one more question, uh, depending on how long this answer goes. Um, this, <laughs> this question is for, for Dr. Vest, but of course Dr. McDowell can jump in. Um, are there any truths that we can know in a non-evidential way? I mean, I don't think that can be a short answer. Uh, it, well, because I think we have to articulate what we mean by truth, right? And, and I know like maybe to you that's like, doesn't seem like uh, something that we should question, but I, do you think that like there is a subjective feeling of truth that is more difficult to kind of wrestle with and kind of an observable objective truth? But even the presence of an objective truth doesn't always rule out <laughs> the possibility of some underlying truth that we can't observe. Does that make sense? So like, I can understand how things in the world work and I can observe it, but that doesn't tell me anything about the truth of things that I can't observe. And so I guess I would say, I'm not sure I want to answer it. Like, I don't know. I, I think the, the idea of certainty in the belief probably resonates. Factually correct is another word we can throw around. Um, but I, I think it, it just kind of depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about things you can't observe, then I would say you probably can't verify the 100% certainty or validity of those things. But subjectively, that doesn't mean they're implausible or even impossible. So one distinction I would make is I don't think knowledge requires certainty. I think knowledge is justified true belief. So I think we can know things in history. I think we can know things in science. I think we can know things through personal experience. I mean, you talked about your wife and how important she is to you. I would presume, maybe this is going too far, but I presume to say you know that you love your wife. I know that I love my wife. I think we can know certain moral things. I know that it's wrong to torture an innocent child for fun. I know that as much as I know anything that you can test scientifically speaking. So I think evidence is just one way we know something. It's an important way. And there's a lot of confidence that comes in scientific ways. But historically, introspection, Reason, I think there's a range of ways that we can know stuff just through a different means. Can I ask yeah, a question? Yeah, please. Uh, do you think it's possible then to know things and feel like you know them, but they're actually like you, what you think you know is incorrect? So, yes and no. <laughs> because the way you phrased it, is it possible to, if I heard you correctly, is it possible to know something, think you're right, but be incorrect? So to know something is to have justified true belief. Okay. So I think you can think you know something is true deeply, but be mistaken about it. So when we, we take, for example, like martyrs. Yeah, martyrs have to be pretty confident to lay down their life. A Muslim terrorist, uh, say a Christian martyr. Both might have equal psychological confidence. That's where the evidence comes in. Psychological confidence is not enough. You can lack confidence in something and be right. You can have confidence in something and be wrong. What's the difference? Is it actually true? And where does the evidence point towards? So I agree firmly. There's a lot of things I look back in my life. I'm like, I was convinced that was true and was really wrong about that, which hopefully makes me more humble about other things I think I believe are true that I could be wrong about that. 
but I don't go so far to say, therefore, I can't know things because it's possible that I'm wrong, I wouldn't take it that far. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree that you can't know things and be justifiably confident in them. I guess the, the, the slippery slope then is just sort of, but I also know that I can know things and feel justified in knowing them, but be 100% incorrect. Right, like I, I mean, we can think of examples probably where people vehemently felt like they knew this to be correct, and they take an action that they vehemently felt was correct, but yep. was clearly very wrong. Yep. Um, yeah, it's That's why I think Christian scriptures talk a lot about humility. <laughs> if we don't have humility and understand our proneness to error, our weaknesses, our biases like you talk about, we're going to do that very thing. It starts with humility hopefully to know things with confidence.